I'll be reading John, first chapter, verses 35 through 51. The next day, John was there again with his two disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent the day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John, you will be called Cephas, which was translated is Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to leave <clears throat> for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching him, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Peter called you, or before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Thank you, Dennis, very much. If you're following along with us in your Bible or mobile device, John 1, verses 35 through 51, we see in this portion of John 1, two things very clearly. The role of every teacher who's a follower of Jesus and the standard for everyone when they begin believing in and following Him. Just a point of clarification so that we all understand who and what we're talking about. In verse 35, where we started, the next day, John was there again with, his, with two of his disciples. Now, don't get confused. We're in the book of John, the Gospel of John. And the Gospel of John is talking about John. However, the John he's talking about in John 1 is not the disciple John that wrote the Gospel of John. Two different Johns. So this John, the next day John was there again with his disciples, is John the baptizer, the last of the Old Testament prophets who would be the forerunner and prepare the way for Jesus the Messiah and his public ministry. And so we see the, John the baptizer in the first chapter of the Gospel of John. I don't want to get confused. We talk about all these Johns. The first thing that we see about the baptizer in this section is that he's pointing people towards Jesus. Verse 36, when he, John the baptizer, saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. Please understand, the biblical standard for every Bible teacher and every pastor, they must always and only point people to Jesus. Look at him, not me. That's what John says. And this is what John will say again in John 3, verse 30. The baptizer will say, he must become greater, I must become less. He greater than I. The moment any teacher takes the focus off of Jesus and onto themselves, they become what the Bible calls an idolater. Putting something as more important than Christ. The moment you, if you say you're a Christ follower, take the focus off of Jesus and put it on you, you commit the sin of idolatry. He must become greater I must become less. Look at him, not me. He's got to be the focal point. 
See, when we boil it down to what it means to be a Christ follower or a Christian, it boils down to this very simple thing. Being a Christian is primarily about Jesus above self. That's primarily what it is. It's as simple as that. Jesus above self. Let me tell you why that's so difficult for people to get. It's not hard to understand. It's hard to get. It's not hard to understand. It's hard to do. And here's why. Because putting Jesus above self is so counter to our culture. Our culture says, I'm above all else. Our culture says, no, you have right. You have, and and if anything goes wrong, you're a victim. It's all about you. It's okay for you to get triggered by all kinds of stuff because it's all about you. The the, the idea that we put Jesus above is counter to culture. And let me say this. It's counter to everything that is social media. I, I don't know if I've ever mentioned my feelings about social media in this church, but, but, but what I believe is this, that everything in culture and the backbone of, so, so of, so, the backbone of it, of social media, is me. It's about how I want people to see me. It's about the image I want to portray about me and my family and my children. It says, look at me. Now, I came up with this idea this week. Now, I'm not a social media er. So, so for, for you social mediaites, I, I would, how about this? How about you only post stuff on social media that brags about somebody else or someone else's kids? No, I mean to that. Okay. <laughs> Just an idea. You don't have to. You don't listen to me about much anyway, so you don't have to listen to me about that. Uh, I'm just saying, like, like how, about, how about like everything we post is not about me and my kids? How about it's all the good stuff about everybody else and their kids? How's that, how, how that, how that work? All right, so anyway. The starting point to obedience of any command in the Bible is to put Jesus ahead of self. We got to understand this. The starting point to obedience to any command. It starts with putting Jesus ahead of ourselves. See, only when I put Jesus ahead of me do I choose to obey him. Does that make sense? It's only like if I put me ahead of him, I'm going to obey me, not him. But if I put him ahead of me, then I'm going to choose to obey him. It's the starting point for the obedience of any command in Scripture. Only when I put Jesus ahead of me do I humble myself. Only when I put Jesus ahead of me do I choose to honor others ahead of myself. Only when I put Jesus ahead of me do I not show up at the church. No, I'm just kidding. Only when I when I put Jesus ahead of me is when it changes how I relate to others, how I talk about it, how I speak, how I feel about it. Only when I put Jesus ahead of me is it changes who I, how I give and how I serve. Does that make sense? Yeah. Amen. Amen. It's only when I put Jesus ahead of me. You know what the vice versa of that is? Do you know what vice versa means? Opposite, yeah. Do you know what the opposite of this is? Yeah, it's, it's not hard. This is a real simple one. I'm not tricking anybody. The opposite is for me to put me ahead of him. That's the opposite of it. In other words, the opposite of this him ahead of me is sin. Now think of, the, think of the word sin. What's the middle letter in the word sin? See, when it's about me, it's sin. When I put me ahead of him, it's about sin. And every biblical teacher, every pastor must preach him ahead of self. And th- this, is, this is part of the danger uh, that professional Christians have who are in ministry. When ministries grow larger and larger and larger, and this is part of the danger when pastors put themselves on a pedestal, when pastors become rock stars, when pastors no longer get their own coffee, when pastors have their own parking spaces that nobody's allowed to park in, when pastors think they are so important they can't get themselves on enough medias and platforms and screens. 
One pastor of a large church in Northern California told me this. He said he keeps himself humble by picking up his own dog poop. Say, because it's real hard to be arrogant when you're picking up poop. (laughs) He must increase, I must decrease. When the two disciples, the two disciples of John the Baptizer, heard John the Baptizer say, look, there's the Son of God, they followed Jesus. These two disciples immediately turned from the one they were following, and follow Jesus. And I love the fact that John didn't even get upset by it. Like, I've said this before. I don't know if you've heard me talk about how insecure pastors are. Pastors are some of those insecure people on the planet. And, and, and to have, to, when, when you're pastoring and someone leaves your church, like, it raises so much insecurity in some pastors. Now, there are other pastors who chase people off. They don't mind at all. But, but, but so these, these two people, they turned from, from John, and, and John wasn't even upset. And some people say, this is the beginning of the church. When, when two things are at play, when there's a faithful minister who's pointing others to Jesus, and there's people who hear him do that and follow Jesus. This is where it starts. And as they, these two approached Jesus, they asked him this question, where are you staying? You know, they, 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 Jesus, Jesus verse, verse 38, turning around, Jesus sees them following him. And they asked him this question, what do you want? He, he, he sees them turning from, from who they were following and, and turning to him. And his question is, what do you want? And it's the same question, every one, every one of us, when we turn from what we are follow and, and turn to him, he asks us the exact same question. And it's much deeper than just what do you want. It's much deeper. We read it as what do you want, but what Jesus is really asking them, and the same thing he asks us is this, what are you searching for? What's at the kernel of your search? See, Jesus knows that every one of us is searching for something. Sometimes the thing that we're searching for is a one that we're searching for. And we bounce from person to person, relationship to relationship. Sometimes it's a thing. One accomplishment to another to another. One to do to another to another. One possession to another to another. Jesus asks us all, once we turn away and we start looking at him, the first question he's going to ask is, what are you searching for? Because Jesus knows that every one of us is searching for something. No matter what we found aside from him, we're searching for something. And Jesus also knows that he's the answer and the starting point to find in what we're searching for. And so they ask him, what? They ask him, where are you staying? What they're really asking is, can we stay with you? And his his response to them is, why don't you just come along? Come along and see. Come along and and you'll see. He doesn't ask him to to, to do it. He doesn't ask him to, at this point, he says, just follow me. And as you follow me, you will see. The answer is very straightforward to the question. Jesus' invitation to every one of us who is searching is come to me and you'll see. This is still Jesus' response to every one of us who want to know him better. He just gives us the invitation, just come and you'll see. And with that invitation is a promise. We know what the promise is to that invitation. Again, a couple chapters later in the book book of John. He says, come to me and you will see. And then in John chapter 6, verse 37, he says this. All those the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never chase you off. I will never drive you away. I know you're searching for something. Come to me and see. And there's safety in that. 
Because no matter what it is you're searching, no matter where your search has taken you, no matter how far that may be from me, you turn around the company and I will never chase you away. I'm going to tell you right now, the two best things you can do today. One, discern and define what it is you're searching for. And secondly, come to Jesus and begin to find it. I love what happens when these guys in the scripture turn and start coming towards Jesus. I love what happens. Watch this. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. Right after he grabbed a bite to eat. Oh, wait, no, that's not what it says. Right after he finished his work at a shift at work. No. As soon as he got a good night's rest and kind of learned some stuff. Wait, no, it doesn't say that either. What's it say? The first thing. Right off the bat. The first thing. He didn't know nothing about nothing. Only thing he knew is now I saw him. And the first thing he did was to find his brother, Simon, and tell him, Hey, we found the Messiah, the Christ. And he brought his brother to Jesus. Listen, once once a person comes into contact with Jesus, once we've heard the invitation to come and see, and we've done that, that person ought to immediately discover their true identity. Before that, we're not sure of our identity. We're searching for who we are, what we do, what we're supposed to be doing for our purpose, for all this stuff. We're searching for acceptance. We're searching for relationships. For all. The moment we come and see and come in contact, we suddenly are aware of our... And I'm going to tell you what you're true. Right? If, you have, if you follow Jesus, if you say that you're a follower of Jesus, I'm going to tell you your true identity. Here it is. You become a missionary to your huddle. That's the Christ followers' true primary and foremost identity to become a missionary to our huddle. There was no other option for the true believer when they say they follow Jesus. Our purpose, the moment we turn and see him, immediately our purpose is to tell our huddle about Jesus and to highlight him over self. When we understand what it is that Jesus does to us and for us when we come to him, why would we not introduce everybody in our huddle who doesn't know him to him? When we understand what he does. You want to know what he does? The, John chapter, well, there's so much stuff in this. I, 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 could, I, could, I could teach about this for... Hours and hours. I won't today. I know there's a playoff game. I want to get there too. But there's so much here. Look at what Jesus does. Jesus looked at him and looked at Simon. Said, you're no longer Simon, son of John. Not third John. Not, not John the baptizer. Not disciple John. This is a whole nother John. So there's a lot of Johns. Jesus looked at Simon and said, you're no longer Simon, son of John. You would be called Cephas. It was translated as Peter. The disciple that's invited to follow Jesus, his name is Simon. But Jesus sees in Simon something no one else sees in Simon. Jesus sees in Simon something Simon doesn't even see in Simon. Jesus sees in Simon who he will become when he's attached to Jesus. He says, now, Simon, that you follow me, now you are Peter. Jesus, what Jesus is doing here, Jesus is addressing Simon prophetically in who he will become once attached to Jesus. Jesus always sees those who come to him in terms of who they will become because they're attached to him. Simon no longer is Simon when he's attached to Jesus. Simon is now Peter, which means the rock. That's an awesome name. Others, here's what, here's what happens. 
other people in our lives. At best, see us who we are at the moment. And at worst, see us who we have been in the past. Do you understand what I'm saying? At best, you all see me who I am in the moment. And at worst, see me who I have been, who you've known me to be in the past. It happens to all of us. But here's the great, here's what Jesus does. When we turn and come to him, when it tests him, Jesus knows that my destiny is greater than my history. So Jesus doesn't refer to me anymore by who I am nor who I've been. Now Jesus only refers to me prophetically and who he's called me to be. And the great thing about this man, Simon, who is now called Peter, the great thing, he's called the rock. He, would spend the, he will spend the next three years of his life walking alongside Jesus, being anything but a rock. He'll live a lot more in the Simon part of his life than in the rock part of his life. Again and again and again, this man will fail. He'll take two steps forward and one step back. Does that sound familiar to anybody? But he will become what God has called him to be, which is the rock, a man of such strong faith that he will become the one who is the leader of the church after Jesus' ascension in heaven. And he will become a martyr, so much so that history tells us, tradition tells us, he was crucified for his faith, not willing to back down or back up, but him, not considering himself equal with Christ, did not consider himself worthy to be crucified like Christ who was crucified upside down. Amazing man of faith. Here's what I know. Every one of us. God is calling us to come and see and to follow Him because you and I are not now what we will be. He calls us into our future self. And we may falter a lot along the way. We may take a lot of steps backwards in the journey. But when we stay attached to Jesus, we will arrive at what He has spoken over us. Here's what I know. Jesus has called us into being. He has called us into and as a new creation, even though He knows And even though he sees our future sin, he still calls us into a new being. This is what love is, and this is what grace does. It cancels all current and future debts against God when we come to him. See if this this hasn't been your experience. Isn't it true that others hold us hostage to the sins of our past. Even though the Bible says, but I'm a new creation. But people hold us hostage to the sin of our past. You know why they do it? It's because they put themselves ahead of Christ. Because Christ has said, I'm a new creation. Here, here's, here's what I've discovered. We are far too fascinated with the sins of others. We are fascinated and infatuated in knowing the sins of others. Listen, everyone don't need to know everybody's past. Here's the thing, you don't need to know my past. I don't trust you with my past. You, you, you don't need to know the trail of my sins. All you need to see is the outgrowth of God's grace. Because God has changed who I've been. And he's given me a new name. This is what God does all through the Bible. This hit me in the first service. And so since I get to the first service, I got to give it to you. This hit me like that God does this all through the Bible. He changes people's names. He changes their identities. The greatest of which is the story in Genesis 28 when Jacob is actually wrestling with God. 
And God changes Jacob's name, any of you know, to what? To Israel. Jacob was the man's name in his rotten self, in his deceitful self, in his trickery self, in his sinful self. And God says, I got a call on you, and it's not to who you've been, it's to who you will be, and I'm going to change your name from Jacob to Israel. Then it's a profound account in Genesis 28. But though God called him, and then that call from Jacob to Israel is transformation, what I love about this story is it's so different than every other name and story of a name change in the Bible. It's profoundly different because all through the Bible, though God changed his name from Jacob, the trickster, the deceitful one, to Israel, all through the Bible, God still refers refers this guy still as Jacob, even though his name's been changed. All through the Bible from that point on, God says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He doesn't say, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. He says, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But wait, God, you changed Jacob's name to Israel. Why are you still calling him Jacob? This doesn't happen in any other name change in the Bible. When God changed Abram's name to Abraham, he was never referred to again as Abram. When God changed Sarai's name to Sarah, she was never referred to again as Sarai. When God changed Paul's or Saul's name into Paul, he was never again referred to as Saul. But Jacob, God changed his name from Jacob to Israel. And all through the Bible, God still says, I am the God of Abraham, yep, of Isaac, yep, and of that guy, Jacob. You know why? Because I think God wanted to tell us that even though I have changed who you are, you still got some Jacob left in you. And even though when you're still Jacob, I'm still your God. I've changed who you are. And even though you got some Jacob, even though you got some Simon in you, when Jacob pops up and Simon pops up, don't you be afraid because I'm still your God. That's why we got to know that I am greater than who I've been. And so are you when you're attached to Christ. I maybe got some Jacob tendencies still left in me. But God says, you are still mine, and I am still your God, even when you're living like Jacob. This is the story of grace. Sometime I'm going to preach a message on Genesis 28. I got to get back to John 1, but there's a lot here. Let me give you one more. Can I give you one more about Genesis 28? Think about the story. If, 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 if you don't, if you never read the, 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 if you aren't familiar with the story, go back and read it sometime, Genesis 28. If you're familiar with it, it'll click as I talk, as, as I talk about it. Jacob's wrestling with God. And it's nighttime. And the Bible says he wrestled all night long. There's so much in this passage, I wish I could preach it. And, and God says, Jacob grabs hold of him. And God, and God says, boy, you better let me go. And Jacob says, I'm not letting you go. I need something from you. And God says, boy, you better let me go. Sun's coming up. You better let me go. If you don't let me go, you're going to die. At that point, Jacob, in defiance, says, I'm letting you go. And so God breaks his hip so that he'll let him go and blesses him. Here's, here's, Here's what just slays me about Genesis 28. Jacob is living in defiance of the word of God. God said, boy, let me go. And Jacob says, no, no, no. I'm putting me ahead of you. I'm not going to let you go. God says, you better let me go. And he says, no, I'm putting me ahead of you. What is that called? Sin. Defiance. And God says, you be- if you don't let me go, you're going to die. And Jacob says, fine. 
I'm going to stay in defiance till I get what I want. So God broke his hip and blessed him. Do you know why God said, let me go, lest you die? Do you know why God was telling him to let him go? Because of his love. He was protected. He was an offer of grace. Because here's what happened. Because the Bible says no, no one can look on God's face and live. It was nighttime when they started rising. The sun was coming. What was about to happen? You're going to see his face. And so God says, for your protection, you need to obey me. And Jacob, in his ignorance and defiance, says, no, I will not. And God breaks his hip and then blesses him. It's the story of grace. Even when we're living in our Jacob times, and God's grace is so profound. He has called us, and he will bless us in order that we might not be destroyed. He can save us. So. For all of you for whom God has called you and changed you, but you still are living like Jacob and you still got some Simon tendencies, rest assured, God says, I will still be your God and there's no way I'm going to lose you. Sometime I'm going to preach on Genesis 28. Not this morning. Just be careful. Not to judge someone too soon. You may be seeing their Jacob. You may be seeing their Simon, but they're called to something else. And God is still committed to them. So don't you judge my Jacob because God has changed my name. Don't you judge someone else's Simon because God has changed their name. You get this? See, Jesus chose to die for and provide a way for forgiveness for all of our sin. And when God chose to love us and Jesus agreed to die for the forgiveness of our sin, all of our sin was in the future. It hadn't happened yet. Our present sin, what you did last night, (laughs) our present sin, was still in the future when God loved us and Jesus died for us. So it's already been provided for. Our only responsibility now, because God has called us, is to turn to him and confess. That means agree with him about our sin. And accept him, follow. Then all of our sin that was still in the future when he died has been covered. So now, because my sin has been covered, when I sin, I repent. That means I turn and change. But I I live in this state of relationship with the Father where my sin in the future has already been covered because I have a relationship with Him and He died for it a long time ago. Does that make sense? You understand what I'm saying? So now, rather than wallowing in forgiven sin, and rather, rather, rather than being a slave to forgiven sin, now I thank God for forgiveness already given, and I live in the perpetual state of His mercy and His grace over it. Because I'm changed. So now all I do as a changed man is plead the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross over my sin that He's already died for. When I understand that, how would I not introduce this God to people in my huddle that don't know him? Verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee and find Philip. He said to Philip, follow me. Again, the call to Christ is a call to follow. The the call to Christ is is, is a call to himself. It's not a call to religion. It's not a call to morality. It's not a call to being a moral person. It's not a call to even being a good person. It's a call to a person. It's a call to himself. To God made flesh. Being a Christian, I'm going to tell you what being a Christian means. Being a Christian hinges hinges on a close personal relationship with the person of Christ. It's it's a call to relationship, not to rules of living. And so many people 
turning to Jesus are trying to obey rules of living rather than to enjoy a relationship. And he says, I want you to follow me. And again, like Andrew to Peter, we see Philip. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip went and did what? Huh? Found Nathaniel. He found Nate. He said, Nate, we found a one. You know, the one we've been reading about, the one Roses wrote about. Wrote about him in the law and the prophets wrote about. It's Jesus of Nazareth. That guy. And then and, and I was like, Chowchilla? How can anything come from Chowchilla? That's the biblical translation in Greek of Nazareth. Here's what we learn. We see it all through the Bible. The lesson we learn is this. When we come to Jesus, now go to your huddle and speak what you know. It's that simple. That's what Philip did to Nate. They just went to Nate and said, hey, this is what I know. We were looking for this guy. We found him. Now come find him. Come, come see. I love the fact that Philip didn't talk theory. Philip didn't talk practice. Philip didn't talk behavior. Philip didn't talk religion. Philip didn't talk politics. All Philip did was talk about what Philip knew. We found him. You need to find him too. That's it. Nathaniel's response, Nazareth. Can anything good come from Nazareth? In essence, here's what Nathaniel was saying. I have my doubts and I have my reasons not to believe you. If any of you have ever been so bold to share faith with someone, you've probably heard that same response, maybe in different words. I have my doubts and I have my reasons not to believe you. And I love Philip's response. It's a, it's a blueprint for all of us. All he said was, okay, come and see. I love the fact that Philip didn't try to convince him. Philip just invited him. Just come see. He, he let Jesus do the convincing because he knew that Jesus was better at convincing. He didn't have to have all the answers. And, and, and honestly, th- th- some of you might, if, you, if, if you're a, a Jesus follower, you might think, well, I'm a Jesus follower, but I'm not really I'm one of those evangelist guys or gals. That, that's, this is a great evangelism strategy. And it's how God has wired some of you to not be a proclaimer, just to be an inviter. And that's how both of these guys got the people in their huddle to meet Jesus. By a simple invitation. I don't have your answers. Just come and see. I'm going to try to argue with you about it. Like, come and see. And this is how this whole thing wraps. I realize what time it is. The game doesn't start for a little while. Just hang with me for just a minute. Watch this. This is this crazy. This, sometimes I get a little, I don't know, I feel like I get a little too excited about some of this stuff, but, but it's fun. So just look, watch it. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said to him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there's no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, Nathanael, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And Jesus was like, really, it's that easy? He said, you you can't believe me because I said I told you that I saw you under a fig tree? He's like, boy, you're going to see things a lot greater than that. Now watch this. He said, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. That weird interaction, let me tell you what's going on. What we're not told in Scripture, but we are told if we understand it, is that Nathaniel was under a fig tree meditating and thinking about Genesis 28, that I just told you about the name change. Because in Genesis 28 is a story about Jacob, the deceiver. How did Jesus address Nathaniel? An Israelite in whom there is no deceit. In that interaction, Genesis 28, Jacob sees the angels of God ascending and descending. 
from heaven to earth on a ladder. Jesus tells Nathaniel, you were impressed with that? Wait a minute, you're going to see what? Angels, let's see. He's quoting what we know, Genesis 28. He's, Nathaniel's meditating on this passage of Scripture and meditating on how do I become that man in whom there is no disease? How do I put myself in a position to see as Jacob did, the angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man? He, he's in that moment thinking, having this devotional moment, and Jesus enters into that and says, I see who you are, and I'm telling you that you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. He says, you're going to see this happen because I am the latter through which heaven is open and the angels ascend and descend on. See, what this means is this, that Jesus is the one who connects heaven to earth. What this tells us is that Jesus is the one, the central point through which heaven's blessings are brought to his people. Everything good, every promise of God, everything God wants to do in you, through you, for you, and by you is not done, is not granted, is not given because you've earned it nor deserve it. It's given and done because and for and through Jesus. And Jesus' words still ring out to us. You will see. Because of me, Jesus said. Heaven opened, the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. And so when our lives are attached to Jesus, we have the opportunity and the option and the, the privilege of seeing angels. Did you know this? And so Jesus says, come to me. And so, I'm, I'm, I'm going to wrap up pretty soon. Watch this. One more thing. I'm going to draw the whole thing together. One more thing. Hebrews 1, are not all, what? Angels, ministering spirits sent to serve those who inherit salvation. Isn't this the angel's job? The writer of Hebrews says, says it's the angel's job to serve, to aid, assist, to help those who have attached their lives to Christ. Now, some angels exist only to worship God 24-7. Read Revelation 7, you'll learn all about it. But there are some angels who exist to serve, assist, and help believers. That's their job. Now, if that's their job, my question is, how do I get angels activated in my life? Right? If their job, this is going to be worth it. If their job is to serve, help, and assist me who will inherit salvation because I've come to Christ, how do I get them activated? You know how? Not ask, not pray. Those all seem like the right answers. I understand. That's what I would answer too. It, it seems like that's right, and I get it. How about I just tell you? Angels only do as commanded by Jesus. They, they don't respond to our prayers. They, they don't move in our lives because we love God. They don't move in our lives because we're obedient. None of that. They only take direction from God. And once Jesus has given direction, they're immediately employed. When Jesus gives answers, they're deployed and they fulfill them. Or gives orders, they're deployed and, and angels fulfill them. So how do you get angels, if you're attached your life to Christ, to serve and assist and help? The Bible tells us. And if you've got a really good Bible, Luke 12, 8 is going to be in it. And so you can check and see if you've got a really good Bible. Here's what the Bible says. This is Jesus talking. Whoever publicly acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man will also what? Acknowledge before whom? The angels of God. Here's what it means. To acknowledge to acknowledge Jesus means to declare openly, to speak out freely, and to profess oneself a worshiper of. What Jesus says is these angels exist to serve, help, and assist those of you who will inherit salvation. If you declare openly, speak out freely, 
and profess oneself to be a worshiper of me because I am the ladder through which the angels ascend and descend and it doesn't happen without you declaring openly, speaking out freely and professing yourself a worshiper of me because I am the hinge point of heaven and earth. So here's how this goes down. We have a relationship with God through faith in Jesus and we have needs. And angels stand at the ready because some of them exist to help, aid, and assist us who have need. And we cry out, God, see my need. God, know what I'm going through. I'm trying to be obedient to you. I'm trying to do everything I know to do, but I need some help. And angels stand at the ready. I'm ready. I exist to serve help and, 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 and give aid to, to that child of yours who is in need. Let, give me the word. And I'll, I hear them saying, I can't go at their request, but I can go at yours. So just say the word and I'll go. And Jesus is standing. And he looks at us. And he looks at them. And he looks at us. And looks at them and says, no, 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 stand down. Because I have given them a huddle before which to Declare openly and to speak freely and to profess himself as a worshiper of me, and they've not. I would love, I love them. And I would love to cut you loose. But I told them how that happens. Do you know why he's orchestrated it this way? Because he has to be the king. He has. He's got to be the priority. And most of the time when we want God to move on our, our behalf, it's because we think we're the priority. God, you have to, you have to, you have to, I have a need. And God, Jesus said, I want to be about me. Because I must increase. You must decrease. And when you decrease and make it about me, Now I intervene. See, Jesus is the key. He's the cornerstone to all God has done, all God will do, and all God wants to do. Jesus is the key. Jesus is the key to turning graves into gardens. Jesus is the key of making armies out of dry bones. Jesus is the key of turning high, making highways from oceans. Jesus is the key of making ways where there was formerly no way. Jesus is the key of turning mourning into dancing. Jesus is the key of turning weaknesses into strength. Jesus is the key of bringing beauty from ashes. Jesus is the key of bringing deliverance from dead ends. It's about him, not me. Jesus is the key. These are written so that we believe. And in that belief, have life in all its fullness. Because Jesus, not us, is the key. Does that make sense? Father, thank you that you love us. Thank you that even in the midst of all our future sin, you chose to love us and Jesus, you chose to be obedient unto death. We confess in this moment that you are the key. And that you are the priority. For those of you who have never yet professed belief in Jesus and put him ahead of self. For, for, for those of us who have done that before, I would invite us to do it again. And in this moment, admit sin. I missed the mark. I'm sorry, God. Thank you, Jesus, that you died to cover that. Tell him, Father, I plead the blood over my sin. I plead the blood of Jesus over me. Help me become the person you have called me into being. This morning again, I choose to believe. Give me life. Father, I thank you that though we've been Jacob's, you've called us. Though we've been Simon's, you've called us. I thank you that even though we live sometimes as our former self, you've called us to a future self and you see us as we future are. Father, we choose to believe. 
And because we choose to believe, do what you said you would do. And turn our graves into gardens. And turns the floods into highways. Give us mercy over our failure. Give us beauty for our ashes. We choose to believe, Jesus, you are the kingpin and the cornerstone. We choose to believe. We love you, Jesus. In your name I pray, amen. Let's sing.